so welcome daniel uh thank you so much for joining me today to to have this kind of interview and dialogue about uh these topics of mutual interest to us uh from you know deliberately developmental spaces your journey uh as someone you know we, we have this interest in kind of ordinary people taking an extra ordinary path in their life mm -hmm. you're choosing an extraordinary path mm -hmm. and you know also the question of you know, i guess understanding the what's happening you know making sense of what's mm -hmm. happening which i think is really interesting to you you've done this whole podcast series about and also you know what not only what kind of what is happening but what can be done about it or mm -hmm. just solutions but what what paths forward are there Hmm. so thank you and i wanted to start maybe just tell me a little bit like how you what was your kind of journey to getting interested in these topics in that broad sense you know what you know hmm. was this something you were already like you know your your family were already interested in these kind of things or it's like a really you know yeah how did you come to this yeah 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 it's good to be here with you rufus um Yeah, you know, I obviously it's it's hard to trace back causes in something as complex as a life. But you know, when I when I reflect back on how it was for me, I think I I, I notice a couple of things. One is, you know, I, I was raised in a family of academics. Everybody in my family is an academic except for me. Although you know, my mom thinks I'm the only true intellectual in the family, which I think is funny. You know, they're all in academia, and my parents are retired. But you know, I remember growing up. And having, you know, what I now realize were pretty, pretty rare kinds of conversations around the dinner table, very interested in kind of conceptual clarity and having the right view about the world and about politics and things like that. That was the kind of water I swam in growing up. Um, and um, I think uh, alongside that, I grew up feeling just... Uh, you know, I, I would I couldn't say it at the time, but I, I think I could say it now. Uh, just an acute sense of alienation and lack of belonging in my life, um, in school, going into college, and even in my family. But going into college, and I remember in college, just uh, almost like taking a tour of all of the major kind of philosophical views that had been produced, you know, this, this is like 2006, 2007. I remember like, I would just wander through the library at my college and like, look for books that might have something that would help. I, I, I you know, and again, I couldn't say this, uh, articulate this clearly at the time, but um, would help me feel less like an alien in the world. And, and in fact, what I eventually I found, I think it was probably like kind of Marxist philosophy. And I found the word alienation. And I remember I found the word alienation, the kind of philosophical concept of alienation. It just like resonated in my whole body. I was like, oh, like I feel alienated. And, and it really touched me even to hear it be described like so vividly. I, I, again, like, you know, it was so kind of incohate at, at the time, but um, I really felt seen by that word. I felt alienated. I felt like I didn't belong in the world. Um, and eventually, um, I think partly through the end of my first relationship and the kind of subsequent depression, I found meditation. Um, and this was at the time that the very first fMRI studies about the the brains of meditators was were being done. And I think that was like enough to pierce my kind of uh, naive, realist, materialist, secular humanist sort of worldview. Where I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I was desperate enough. I was like, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try meditating, um, and uh, yeah, and and it was, you know, it was the only thing I found in my sampling of different worldviews and philosophies that like actually made a difference and and kept making a difference. And the more I did it, the more of a difference it made. The more I and I, I think like you know, the more I felt like at home in life. Um, not linearly, right? Like there were periods of intense suffering and, and pain, but it felt like I was, yeah, on a path all of a sudden and one that I I, I kind of trusted. Um, And yeah, so that's like one, one big dimension of my life, I think is just like contemplative practice, a path of transformation. I, I would say now like learning how to live a good life or what it means to live a good life, a true life, a beautiful life. And then, you know, the kind of... um 
systems change stuff, which you alluded to, um, like what what is this larger situation, the kind of context that we're in? That that's uh, also you know I, I I don't know how or when that kind of kicked off. I remember. I remember after a 20 day retreat, this is after I, I graduated college, I had done a 20 day retreat in the Goinka tradition and I left the retreat and on the bus ride out of the retreat center, I on Facebook saw a video of Occupy Wall Street. And these, this was the very first um, kind of major arrests, I think that kind of pop, like popped Occupy into the collective consciousness. And I saw that video and it was just like, maybe it's probably because of the meditation. I was just like, oh, I have to be there. I have to be there. And I, I, you know, just went there. And I think that was also a real um, breakthrough in my kind of just consciousness about what my responsibility was to the whole. And I think a lot of people, you know, Occupy, did it fail? Was it successful? That's an interesting question. But certainly for the people that participated in it, it was highly educational. You know, everybody that I know that was there and that was really there, you know, I was there for like six months or so, really full time. Um, everybody that was there, it completely changed their life. Like the their life was unfolded differently from that. Um, and so, you know, that was really, Im that really impressed something about, um, about systems changey, kind of like what time it is on the planet sort of thing uh, that, that then impacted the rest of my life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, um, so that's what what happened then. Like, so after Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. you've got this. You've got this practice. You've said you've come from a background with a lot of kind of questioning. You're kind of lost initially. Kind of even going back, you start mm -hmm. to find this practice that's useful. And it's an alternative worldview. Could you say a bit more about like what Occupy Wall Street actually impacted on you? Like what mm. what was your experience? Or what mm. yeah? Because I know other people. You're right in the space. I mean, funny enough, I walked past Occupy Wall Street right at the beginning of it. I was in a, <laughs> I was there for a UN conference at the time, and I'd been put up in a in a hotel on Wall Street, which I was a bit surprised. Mm. I was in this conference about open information and government transparency. And I walked past, and I was like, why is there all these police around? And it's like, mm. <laughs> I kind of knew about the news, but I didn't do, I mean, funny enough, I'd been involved in similar things, but I, I would literally walk past the very beginning of Occupy Wall Street, mm. but didn't, didn't participate. But mm. I'm like kind of wondering if like, what on that journey for you, you know, what, what did you see out of it? And what did you, what, you know, yeah, the past experience of what, it, what trajectory it shifted you onto? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of pieces to that. One is just like, um, I got really into facilitation and group dynamics. And like, I, one of the things I did at Occupy Wall Street was I was on the facilitation working group. So I would help facilitate these enormous uh, consensus decision-making meetings, which, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about the limitations of consensus. But at the time I was really um, amazed at uh, sort of like how groups of people could, could come together in ways that produced, I don't know, like different, like uh, different kinds of choice making, different kinds of worlds, different kinds of possibilities. You know, I just got really interested in facilitation and group dynamics and um, all that kind of thing. Uh, so that's one dimension, I, and that has carried through my life, like that that kind of um, interest. But but I think deeper than that was the felt sense of what it was like to be in a big group of people that was organized according to something other than obligation and coercion. Everybody wanted to be there. Everybody believed in what they were doing. Everybody, there was like hope. There was real hope. You know, it was a prayer, really. I mean, it, might, it, was, it was, there was beauty there. There was love there in, in the group, in the field. And, and people were just doing their best. Oh, it was so problematic. There was so much that was you know, kind of ugly and messed up and poorly designed. And I have lots of critiques, but there was a, just a raw kind of naive beauty and hope and, um, uh, 
it was like we really thought we really thought i know i really thought and others did too we really thought we were, like, we were about to change the world and, and you could feel it and it was just it was like oh the world is malleable like we're just a bunch of you know kids mostly i was like 23 or 24 i don't know how old. i was a young you know and we were just like oh wow we have power you know, um, it's not power that somebody gave us. It's power that we're taking and that we're giving each other. And it's, it's, it was, yeah, I can even feel it now in my body as I talk about it. It was just like electrifying. It was like something in my organism woke up. Um, yeah. Wow. And so out of that, you know, you spent six months there. I mean, you said that was like full, full on in, in New York. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah. what, what was your, the path? What, what happened afterwards? Well, <laughs> a couple of things. One is I, I, I got more or less like, I wouldn't say kicked out of the, of Occupy, but certainly like, you know, sort of like exiled a little bit for a particular reason that I want to share. Cause I think it's relevant to, our mutual uh, interest, which is, I realized at some point in doing, in, in being a facilitator and trying to like organize the group in a kind of particular way that there were people in this movement who were obstructing its success. And, you know, we would talk about whether they were agents, you know, behind, behind closed doors, we'd be like, oh, is there, are there plants from, you know, um, organizations that actually don't want Occupy to be successful. They actually don't want us to, to, to succeed, which I think is a reasonable thing to assume. We did research on these people. We had reason to suspect they might be, or perhaps they just were kind of, uh, you know, for whatever reason, unable to participate in good faith in um, the kind of processes that we had created. And so I naively uh, attempted to draft a proposal to create a way to basically kick people out of the out of the movement. And uh, <laughs> of course, uh, in the sort of like pre-voting, pre-consensus decision-making kind of discussion about the proposal, everybody who we I had previously identified as possibly being an agent or an, a person who would obstruct the consensus process showed up and just like destroyed me. And, you know, the, and, and it was a really clear demonstration of the failure of inclusivity as a sacred value you know and 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 indeed i now see that any value that you make as a kind of totalizing absolute value uh is kind of evil actually like you can't do it that way you you need to be more hacked, yeah. vulnerable to being hacked and so just to kind of It'd be exactly, exactly. And so, you know, I, and, and that just wrecked me that bro broke my heart completely. And I, and soon after I had to leave it, it like my health started to decline and, uh, I left, I left, I got, I got arrested, you know, uh, which is, which is good, uh, good, good experience. And then I left New York city kind of with a little bit with my tail between my legs, um, and, and moved to Boulder, Colorado, where I worked for, um, this company, Buddhist geeks for, yep. A while if you're familiar, you're familiar with buddhist geeks yeah. cool yeah yeah um it, it was kind of helping them run their conferences and uh help them build their online community which was a kind of like post traditional trans lineage online uh sangha and Bo buddhist geeks for those who don't know is a, it was a sort of media project primarily a podcast that was really interested in the intersection of contemplative practice and like emerging global culture and technology and and things like that and it was really a really really interesting scene at that time and i don't know like um the early 2010s um yeah events and not enough events and you yeah and so you were, so you were involved in that. Wow. So, and how were you connect? How do you even know about that? Like, it's kind of not, not the most obvious thing to know about. Buddhist geeks. Yeah. Well, how did you, so out of Occupy, I mean, how did you know, like, how, how did you know you were going to, you know, how did you find out that's even interested? I'm just interested in those kind of. Uh, oh, those well, so I, I mean, I, I, you know, when I first started getting into Buddhism, uh, in meditation, I, yeah, I mean, everything felt kind of not super like resonant with me and my culture 
you know, as like a techie young man. And, but then Buddhist Geeks was like, you know, really, it really felt like it got me. And I would be walking around all the time, all the time listening to Buddhist Geeks. I was just always, that was my um, way in to the Dharma for sure. Uh, and then at some point, I think Vince Horn, the host of Buddhist Geeks, like asked for volunteers for some task. And I responded and then actually did the did the thing on time and as requested. And he emailed me and said that I was the first person who had ever volunteered and done the thing on time and as requested. And we kind of struck up a friendship. And eventually he kind of asked me for uh, if I wanted to work with him. And um, yeah. yeah, I was really lucky, really lucky, really lucky. Yeah. Right. So, so you go to Boulder and you're in Boulder, Colorado, working at Buddhist Geeks, which is obviously also pretty, I mean, I know Vin, Vin just for re listeners background, I, I mean, also know had really been obviously involved in the integral scene. I mean, he'd been yeah. at the integral Institute uh, from a recording I interviewed I did with him. Um, but yeah, so you're there in Boulder, Colorado and what happened, you know, yeah. What happens next kind of thing in this? Oh, I mean, I, I really threw myself into, working with Vince, working at Buddhist Geeks, it was, it really like, I gave, gave it my all. And I think we created something really beautiful. We created the Buddhist Geeks community, which um, was an early experiment, I think, in, in online video-based kind of community building. Um, I used a lot of the frames and facilitative processes that I learned at Occupy, kind of trying to transpose them into an online space. Um, and it was it was very beautiful and it we ultimately couldn't find a business model that was successful and so uh, it's interesting we actually like kind of closed down the project but there was enough um kind of coherence and participation energy in the in the community that we built that they the, the community itself sort of jumped ship and created their own community which still exists called dharma mechanics um really interesting project they've been going on now for i mean I don't know, it would have been like 15 years or 14 or 13 years, um, just having ongoing conversations about all kinds of things, contemplative and hosting online retreats. This has been going on. And so I feel, I feel, yeah, proud of that. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and as part of, as part of that, um, online community, I hosted a interview show where I spoke with Buddhist teachers, um, you know, I, I receive questions from the community, but also just ask questions um, of, of Buddhist teachers. And one of the teachers that I interviewed was Soryu Forall. Um, Soryu Forall is the founder of the Monastic Academy. And uh, I was really struck by him, his vision um, for the Monastic Academy, which at the time was just beginning. And I remember uh, <laughs> after the interview with him, I... I said, man, sorry, this is amazing. I'm really impressed by what you're doing. You know, if I if I didn't have this job that I love, I would probably come and, and join you. And he was like, oh, that's that's great to hear. Yeah, um, would you know, would love to have you. And then like a month or two later, I lost. We, uh, you know, we we didn't have the money to continue to pay me, and so I had to leave that job. And um, yeah, I I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to Maple. And um, yeah. And that was what around around 2015. Oh God, I really don't not good enough years. Probably something like that. Yeah, it must have been something like that. It's okay. So you arrive, you arrive. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, tell me a little bit. Tell you know people listening maybe don't have a lot of context about may or may not know a lot about saw you for you or or the mm -hmm. academy. Do you want to give a little bit of a yeah yeah sketch? So, that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Soryu is probably like 48 years old. He's a, a an American Buddhist monk who uh, grew up in Vermont and went to train in Japan at the age of, uh, I think, 18 um, and, and, and spent something like in total about 10 years in, in monastic training before at some point coming back to the U.S. and spending a lot of time with Shinzen Young, um, who's a, a very interesting contemporary Buddhist teacher. He's quite old now, but um, he's done a lot of work to um, render deep and rigorous contemplative practice into the frame of science and 
kind of rational um language i don't know what to say um uh and so he he studied with shinzen and and at some point i think he he felt inspired to create a kind of like really like a modern monastery uh based on shinzen's teachings but more kind of trying to like feel like what what does a monastery which has been such an essential and ever present cultural form in in many cultures you know, a, a place where people can go to transform their mind uh and we could talk about like what what that means but what what would that look like in america in the western context not just trying to like you know kind of pick up and drop a traditional eastern monastery into the West, which is a lot of the monasteries you might see that are in America are kind of just like imports, but actually trying to like kind of innovate something that's a, that's, that's an yeah. emergent within our cultural context. And, um, you know, so for him, uh, he talked about it, uh, often in terms of the relationship between awakening and responsibility. And so you know, for him, uh, part of what was true in our context was that we we're in a time of profound crisis profound planetary crisis. He didn't have the term metacrisis at the time, but from a very young age, he could see that human beings were debasing and destroying life. And so he was very, very, very deeply, you know, his heart was just very deeply uh, moved and beholden to that seeing. And so he was... Um, very interested in, in kind of creating a space where people could come into right relationship with with that reality through the practice of uh deep contemplative training um and 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 find out for themselves like what role does you know um awakening have when it comes to this very dire uh very real situation that we find ourselves in if we if we look clearly and 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 of course there's so much to be said about that and so you know he 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 created um the monastic academy and it's evolved a lot over the years it's evolved a lot over the years um, when i got there you know i just showed up at what at the time was a group in a group of i don't know like 10 people uh we 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 lived and meditated and worked in a Quaker meeting house in Burlington, Vermont. So you grew up as a Quaker. So I just showed up in this, in this space. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, I mean, there's, there's much that could be said about, about Maple, but maybe that's a way to open it up a little bit. Oh, it's very, really, uh, Beautiful. I think it's only questions that become like the role, you know, that will be threads to come back to, you know, in a moment, maybe is the, the role of awakening in this, this moment of this mm. crisis, poly crisis, meta crisis, or just, you know, very obvious climate crisis, ecological crisis, and um, seeing that, you know, the capacity to see that and hold that, um, which is kind of a first step. But I want to just to say a bit more than One thing I guess I just want to ask for a moment, I think this comes mm -hmm. to me is, I don't know, it's a question, maybe it could be like you have brothers or sisters, maybe it could be that you have friends, but there seems quite, quite unusual about your path. Like the fact you're just like, okay, I, I finished Buddhist Geeks, okay, I just show up at this Quaker meeting, you know, I, I'm just going to, mm -hmm. you know, or I just show up at Occupy, I just got to go, to, you know, there's, there's something there. And I don't mean it's not a, but to contrast sometimes just be like, what has it that do you think, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever discussed like your, the, the way you see the world with like, you might be your family or it might be with friends, you know, who you went to high school with or even university. And what has it that you have this kind of, the, this path, which is often taking maybe, it seems like a, a, a less well-trodden one, but also one with like some degree of uncertainty, like, you know, who knows, you're going to go to Manassas Academy, you know, you know, and probably one, I don't know, I think of my own parents where I like, you know, I was like, yeah. you know, maybe just to share one tiny bit for myself, you know, it's mainly about you, but I, I've looked at my life as what I sometimes think of, not to judge them, but like fail breakthroughs, moments where I felt mm. intuition. Uh, for example, I felt a very strong one just to share, you know, at the end of university, I felt very 
lost. And I, I was supposed to do this PhD in mathematics. You know, I had this place at, at Cambridge actually, and it kind of fell through. I was so delighted that really in my heart they had fallen through, you know, like, <laughs> really, like because I didn't, I, I don't know. And I hadn't had this year where I didn't have anything to do, right? Because I didn't have this mm. PhD and it wasn't planned. And I was going to like, I, I remember the kind of heart direction I wanted to go in, you know, in, in myself, which was of inquiry of really looking deeply. But then I remember, you know, whether it was my my mother or just like, but it was, or, or even it just a voice in my head of like, well, what are you going to do? What what are you going to do? You know, what mm-hmm. this 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 kind of sitting, you know, even if you're not, right. where's your job? You know, what what's going to happen right. to you? Kind of in my right. head, and so I kind of interested almost in the courage, or maybe you wouldn't describe it as courage, or just like what had it that you that you had these intuitions, but were able to act on them. And maybe in like looking also at like friends or family when, you know, would, would they question this? Would they be like, oh, well, what are you doing, Daniel? (laughs) Right. (laughs) What are you doing with your life? You know, um, how did that ever happen? And how did you, what, how enabled you to stay so kind of heart centered in a way? Yeah. Two things come to mind. One was, you know, my parents have always been incredibly supportive. I'm sure that at various times they were like, inside of them they were like what are you doing but externally they were yeah they they were they they trusted me in some in some way that i i i I, in this moment just feel really touched by and really grateful for um and then the other thing that that comes is uh, i remember after i graduated college i went and lived in washington dc and i started to try to get into the nonprofit industrial complex you know right. it was just like you know and, and i tried to get a job and I, tried, I like interned and i started it i you know there was i think then this just like hope to be as as you do when you're young i think like a hope to be used well or or to to help somehow do good things and i could just i could just see that that wasn't what was going on there and I started to get really depressed. I actually started to like drink more. I, 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 I and I could feel myself going in a direction that I was lonely, um, very lonely, very, very like it's a dark. It was dark. And at the same time, I was listening to Buddhist geeks, and I had done one ten day retreat at that point. And I don't know what happened, but I was like, oh, if I don't do something, I'm like, I I don't know what's going to happen. And it was in that, and I was like, and the only thing that made sense, because I had no idea what to do, was to just go meditate. And and so I went and lived at a Goinka center, a kind of a meditation center for like a year and a half. I was just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, but this, this seems like the, the only thing that seems like trustworthy. Mm. Uh, and I think I was like close enough to the edge that I was just like, all right, I'm just gonna leap. And, mm. uh, and it worked, it, you know, it, it, it was, it was not like it worked, like I was happy or something, but I could, I felt a sense of like, oh, like I, I, I did the hard thing, but it was the right thing or something. Um, I felt true somehow. And I think that gave me some kind of um, faith, some, some kind of faith. And and then when similar kind of juncture points happened, I, I, I had the, I had enough faith to like leap again. Yes. Um, and the more that I have leapt, the more that I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, it's like safe to fall. It's safe to leap. It's safe to, um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I think, and it's, it's something that I'm interested in these kind of series that we're doing this ordinary people choosing extraordinary path is not there's like, yeah what patterns are there and i think one thing you know that allows people to touch maybe their heart clearer and one of those you say it's like the support maybe it's parents maybe it's friends maybe it's other Mm -hmm. people who who give you that kind of faith and also 
the other very interesting thing is being near the I mean, the, I think mm -hmm. for me, what's fascinating in that story is was well, going to Guenka, but actually the, the experience of being the nonprofit and being able to see the suffering and that something was there. Because I would say I tolerated that for a lot longer. And I, I sometimes <laughs> joke, it might sound bad to me, but I was, I remember another kind of, like I ended up doing a PhD in economics, basically, which I didn't want to do, really. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and the, I sometimes think is also is that sometimes your greatest misfortune you can have in life is to be, to kind of um, not have the breakdown. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. And not, 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 I don't mean the breakdown like fully enough, but I mean, not have like something not working, but you know, like imagine you've gone to a nonprofit and it hadn't been too bad or you got like rapidly promoted and you know, or they got a big grant and then you have a team and then you're like suddenly in this system and it's really yes. not working really. But yeah. whereas actually you kind of, you know, for me, I always look back, the point that I had a breakthrough in my life was basically, I was, I go PhD. I even get this, I don't even want to, I, I got this fellowship. You know? Yes. It was at the end of it when I got my papers rejected. So just put kind of added to the story. I've got these papers, you know, I don't want to become an academic, but what right. but, you know, but I'm about, you know, I'm going to go for 10 years. I need published papers. And they get like this top journal where I'm almost maybe get, like one reviewer says go in and the other doesn't it. And up the editor says, no, we're not going to take it. And it was this huge breakthrough I remember for me. Hmm. Like actually this was the gift. Hmm. And it had actually been a curse previously because in a moment I was like, I'm not upset at all. I mean, I'm upset in my ego in some part. You know, of course I feel rejected. But deep down, I was like, thank God I'm not going to become an academic economist, you know, um, uh, or something. Right. Yeah. And it was like, it was like, I think that that's really interesting also in your story is the mo all, all the other ones, but in that that moment of like, ah, oh, something not working and also f sent no realizing it, you know, which took a, mm -hmm. you know, so I, wanna, I just think that's really interesting. And I want to remark on that is that I think sometimes the greatest curse is to get what you want in something, totally. no, but not really want, you know? And, and yeah. so, yeah. yeah totally. So anyways, coming back to maybe Maple, you're there, mm -hmm. you're in, you're in a, you're in the, the Quaker meeting house and, and <laughs> maybe tell people a bit more. So there's this vision. What, what was the idea of monastic academies? You said it was like somehow in the monastic tradition, I mean, there's in the name, but the fact it's called a monastic academy, it was to innovate in some way. You know, saw you had this vision, and you obviously ended up taking quite a bit some part in that. Tell me a bit more about that because it really connects to this interest we have of like conscious collectives that we talk about here at Life Itself, or de more like geekily deliberately developmental spaces, right? Creating these new kinds of environments yes. where in a in a development or conscious, you could say, kind of conscious inner development is mixed also with other kind of activities, you know, with, with our yeah. also day to day, you know, in some way. So tell me a bit more about that project and yeah. your life. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there's so many ways to talk about it and there's so many ways that we have talked about it at Maple. And, and, and I think partly we're learning how to clarify the value of such spaces within our culture and time. And so, you know, Maybe I'll say um, the, the the kind of way that I hold maybe the inquiry that I was on, and and I think that Maple is on. Although I don't I don't know that Maple would talk about itself this way. Is like who do I need to become in order to step into the meta crisis from with responsibility, like appropriately, like so that. And this is just how it lives for me so that I can look at my now 10 year old niece when we're both older and I can look her in the eye and say, I did what I could. What, who, who do I need to become and how do I become that person? You know? Um, and uh, I think the, the sorry strong sense. And, and now my, my strong sense is that it, it's something about that, that, that these like contemplative, these wisdom traditions, have a very significant piece of the answer to that. Um, and we can, you know, kind of supplement that with John Verveke and all the other kind of contemporary theorists who are trying to really, again, render the value of this kind of thing into a frame and language that we who have grown up in the West can understand. But um, it's, 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 for me, it's a kind of existential, uh, inquiry is like, 
given what is happening right now, given that I graduated college and with an earnest, sincere desire to be of service was, you know, the best that I could do was be slotted into a kind of strange money making machine called a nonprofit. Like g given that, like, you know, if we're like, do, you know, it's not working, like, what do we do? What do we do then? Like, do we, I don't, the answer is not pretend or, or, you know, um, try to get what you can out of a dying system. Like there has to be some other move. How do we, what move is that? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I think, you know, my, my own inquiry with that clarified is like, it's something about a, a transformation of the interior that allows us to, to move in the world in a different way. And I think, you know, importantly in a different way together. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so really kind of creating a space where that we can really be with that inquiry. Uh, and the difficulty in that, because you know, so many people don't look at the situation because uh, it, it challenges everything. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's very hard to look at it kind of squarely while still being in the system. Like you kind of yeah. almost need to move into a liminal space, which a monastery kind of is for a lot of people where, where you, you, you know, you don't have all the, what is it like cognitive dissonance and sunk cost fallacies that are kind of uh, making it hard to see what is actually being called for um, in our lives. Yes. Yeah. I just want to draw on that thread for myself for a moment, which is to say that to make that kind of concrete, when we say like kind of distance, you know, if you're around a bunch of people, like as I was, I was also in, I was actually, in, I ran a nonprofit. I was in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, And as you say, or I was an economist, you know, even if, you know, economists, by the way, should be given much better respect maybe than they're due, even if I think they're, <laughs> they're very much in modernity. Um, there's this issue that everyone around you, like almost will actually feel threatened by it or, or angry even about these kind of Absolutely. things. Um, and it's kind of also bizarre, like you feel, I don't know whether, I don't know your experience, but I can just talk of one, which is, so we were funded by the Amidia, Pierre Amidia and Amidia, the Amidia Network. And I remember going, like, must have been, that they basically had a massive conference at that point for all of their fund grantees. Hmm. Like, you're flown, you're flown to San Francisco and um, this must be like 2011, 2012, I can't remember. It was what, it was basically around that time. And, you know, so you're flying to San Francisco, you're put up in this, you know, hotel, the massive conference center. And then we have like Reed Hoffman, who people don't know is the founder mm. of LinkedIn, come on stage to tell us like, you know, here's how you retain talent. You know, uh, this is like kind of bizarre. Like, and we're giving his book in our thing called like the start of a startup of you, how to treat your own life like a startup. <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. Reed's giving this lecture about how we can retain, like, first of all, you know, LinkedIn is like one of the most well funded you know, how they retain talent and hire engineers yeah. and what we should be doing in a nonprofit on a shoestring. But also just this bizarre experience of like, you know, we're all like, you know, then there's this big, like, they give out these mid year awards and, you know, change to the, the CEO. It's just like this, I, I remember for myself just thinking like, am I going crazy that I feel like so, like the word alienated here, not that making other people wrong, but like, don't we, like nothing that's wrong with them, but like this, the, something just deeply mm. bizarre about this whole experience as well that we're all like non-profits we're all here on this kind of like it's kind of like almost like we're in silicon valley but we're yes yeah it's just really odd and at the same time it's like no one else seems to be thinking that so i'm mm. just shouting which is this cognitive distance point is that at least for my part i was left like i'm going crazy you know like this right 
and I, and I went back, you know, just to be clear, I would, you know, you go back and be like, okay, well, how do I now get more money? You know, I've got to mm. do more. We've got to, we've got to, you know, because also in that energy, it's yeah. like, well, how should you raise or what projects are you doing? Or, totally. you know, what what's on your CV in some way? And you're doing that. And the worst is you're doing that to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I now, now I would say that's like, that's how Moloch works you know, the God of bad incentives, right? Like he, it, the, the system that is sort of destroy, destroying life on earth from a certain perspective, right? That's sort of like yeah. extincting species and- um, Running know, our own existence, yeah. Right. Um, it, we can certainly see it reflected in all these places, but it, it lives in us. It lives yeah. right in us. It, it is, it is, you know, culture is stored holographically in the minds of humans and the hearts of humans. And um, we are doing it. We are doing it. And that's part of what is so hard to see because we do love the world. And so to see the way that we are doing it, it, it takes great courage and it takes great humility. And it's like, it's painful it's very painful to do that. And it's, and it, you, it's really hard to do it alone or in a system where everybody yes. else is kind of trying to pretend that they're not doing it. Right. And so that's part of the value of these sorts of spaces like monasteries. It's like, you, you know, it, it, it's a real, it's ideally it's a time to like really be with the truth of it. Like, Oh, like I, I am confused actually and i'm 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 able to be i'm i'm vulnerable I, i've hurt people i can hurt people like i i i can easily become a tool of this system that isn't aligned with love and truth and goodness um oh no you know um i really don't want to do that but i but i keep doing it oh no you know like that that whole process is like very vulnerable and very uh it's, it's really hard really hard to be true to that. Um, and I, I know very few people who can really be true to that on their own. In fact, I don't, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was, I mean, I want to, because it does bring us, because like, I guess the story you say, the kind of distance and um, my experience of what you're saying there, the lesson I was coming to, and I was going to ask, it's like, I know it's, you know, I, I, I could see it, or I even went on retreat sometimes, or even a fish story. I think John Cabot Zinn's son led a, a meditation session at this Amidia event, I remember. Mm. And I remember actually going up to him asking him and saying, but like I feel, you know, because I've been a meditator at this point for quite a while, but I was like, don't don't you see some dissonance? Or what or what should I how, how I feel that this calls into question what I'm even doing? What should I do? And I remember, like, well, you know, he did he was there to lead a half an hour session, but it was the question I want to come to is like, what helps people sit with that and sustain it? And you already alluded to it of like on your own, it's yes. very difficult to do that. Cause I think oh, yeah. that's the thing is that I think many people glimpse parts of that um, uh, or have it momentarily. And even today, you know, people, people have psychedelic experience, they go on retreat or they simply are just confronted by, by something in the news but without, what is it, and I want to come back there for also to both your insights, but also maybe the Monastic Academy of like, what is it that it takes for people to be able to really sit and sustain that insight that it becomes, um, that it allows them to like walk the different path in a way? Like, because I guess th that's mm -hmm. part of the inquiry that I have. Yeah. So, you you know, and you alluded yeah. maybe a bit more about this, like on your own, it's very hard. Yeah. It's, 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 it's friendship. It's friendship. You know, there's there's one of the most, as I'm sure you know, um, famous passages in the Pali Canon, the, the, the kind of Buddhist Bible is, uh, um, you know, Ananda, the Buddha's right-hand man, goes up to him and says, hey, Buddha, you know, it seems to me, based on all my training and seeing that friendship is at least half of the path. And the Buddha says, do not say that, Ananda, friendship is the whole of the path friendship is the whole of the path we we like the whole idea that we could do this alone is itself indicative of the deep confusion 
that we are in that is is it's been constructed by the system i believe that wants to keep us disempowered and 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 confused like you we need each other we deeply need each other we we not just as as mirrors like i see you breaking free so i feel like oh i can do it i can break free but when i'm in deep pain deep deep pain and confusion and i'm, I'm disoriented like really I don't care how good your practice is. Like you need somebody else. You need another human heart that's just there with you, listening to you, holding space for you, caring for you. Um, that's what makes the difference when things are really hard. Um, and 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 it has and this is this is the key in my in my view. It has to be friendship that's rooted in a shared love of truth and of goodness. Like virtuous friendship, really, that that is there is such a thing, right? There is such a thing as virtuous friendship. and and that is the path. Like the path for me, like I know that I'm unfolding if I'm able to be better a better friend. and I'm able to receive friendship more fully. Like that's for me, that's like the litmus. Um, it's not like how well can I follow my breath? Like no. Um, it's, it's like, how well can I receive the love of my friends and how well can I be there for them? How well can I love them? Um, and, and it's just, it's just, you know, that's just has to be, we have to see that it's, it's, you know, meditation gets unbundled from this deep wisdom tradition of Buddhism. And, and we kind of try to just like take meditation and think like, oh, this will, this will do, this will make things better. And to a certain degree, that's that's true, but like it's not. It's got to be friendship. <laughs> like that was the thing that we were really doing at Maple, honestly. Yes, was friendship. You know, meditation was just a way that we could clarify our ability to be able to be friends. Um, and and you know that that's really what I learned there was yeah, like what it takes to show up um, for others and and allow yourself to be shown up for. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know how to do that before Maple. And I, I think I have a, I have a, a more of a sense of it, um, now. I mean, yes, of course, meditation is beautiful and wonderful. Great. Yes, it's yeah. really, really, really wonderful. But like, it's friendship. Can you say a bit more about what it takes to, to show up for others and, and for others to mm -hmm. show up for you? Like you said, that was something you really started to see out of the practice, the experience of, of, of Maple, um, yeah, and also say a bit more about like so you just to give maybe even just before that you arrive you know you're in a house what 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 did monastic academy evolve into like as a as a pro like just in a kind of concrete sense for people who maybe aren't as familiar with it like hmm. you know at the beginning there's ten of you in in the kind of the Quaker meeting house how did it evolve like it ended up with a, with a camp kind of a campus or a monastery and 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 maybe also weave into that you know what is this showing up for others and yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so, um, let's see, how did it unfold? I mean, uh, it, we, when I got there, we spent about a year at the Quaker Meeting House campus. There were maybe like eight to 10 of us at that time. Eventually we moved to a larger campus, um, kind of in the Northeast, Northeast kingdom of Vermont for a little while. And then we moved to an even bigger campus, um, where eventually where it is now and and you know we had we, we were usually for most of the time I was there for like the last three years um you know between like 20 25 to 30 people um residents guests uh people coming for retreats and you know it it, it was always that living inquiry I think into the relationship between, awakening practice, contemplative practice, and like being of service, taking responsibility, be, being, responding to the world. Um, and we did, we tried lots of different things, you know, it was very experimental. We made soft, we made my, software that taught mindfulness in public schools. We made online courses. We would create all kinds of different retreats. Um, I led a three month retreat trying to experiment with an ecology of practices at the Canadian branch. We had 
two more branches at one point. So there are three branches of the monastic academy at one point. Um, and yeah, it was like, you know, we, we did retreats. We did a, at least a week long retreat every month. We did, I, I did um, three different solitary retreats in the, in, in a cabin for, uh, you know, 75 days or more. Um, and, and it was a whole, it was a whole culture, you know, it's, it's very rich. There were, and, um, I think, you know, now, um, I'm no, I'm no longer at Maple um, just to be clear, but now Maple is very, um, kind of dialed into AI. So they're very interested in how to, um, I would say like bind, these emerging intelligences to wisdom and how to make them uh, how to how, how to have AI create the conditions for more human wisdom. Um, but I, I haven't, you know, I don't know what they're exactly doing right now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, a sense of it. Is that that's really yeah. is really yeah. what I, I guess I would also be interested in is so what what were you saying about the ecology of practice and what is challenging? And I'm just to share, you know, I'm obviously very interested. Life is we have, I'm actually right now in the Bergerac Hub. Um, I think more generally what you said is that people recognize maybe that friendship, uh, mm -hmm. call it spiritual or virtuous friendship or people with, there's a, there's maybe a shared, some shared commitment, but shared virtue to it is important and that maybe that means being either proximate online in a regular basis maybe proximate mm -hmm. even physically you know I, I like talking about like intentional conscious neighborhoods mm -hmm. or conscious collectives mm -hmm. and i'm interested though in the practical of like why that's hard <laughs> maybe yeah. hard financially or materially to make work maybe it's hard uh, socially or I call, like psycho spiritually to make work, but mm -hmm. also what we can learn, you know, like, of course we know that and we can kind of learn from what worked. And like in one way, in some ways I just want to, you know, my, my impression, I, I haven't sadly in the period that it's been around, I think I've been a kid and stuff, but I, mm -hmm. you know, I think I look at monastic Academy, we wrote it up in our study actually of, mm -hmm. of deliberate oriental spaces, but you know, we can learn a lot. And also I think that it's important to both, you know, acknowledge the challenges, but maybe, more broadly, people realize, oh, yeah, there are alternative ways to live. And that don't, you know, classically, the sense of monastery is like, oh, I'm going to basically, I give away all my possessions, I become a monk. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to understand that there are maybe these like in between, you know, uh, or things where you mm -hmm. can be proximate to the mainstream, yet really living differently with others. I mean, that's the whole yes. idea of kind of transformative second Renaissance regions. But, you know, yes. could you say more about like the concrete experience of Maple of like what you learn about like, some of the challenges maybe but also ways that were successful you know it's very successful in many ways in fact yes running these alternative things and you you were even like building things it wasn't just like pure like we're just sitting and meditating you know you built software you did all this stuff exactly you give paint a bit more of a picture of that and also about the ecology of practices that you know that worked and didn't work maybe a bit yeah i think i think um you know uh what 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 worked what I, I have no doubt worked was that soryu managed to create a culture that was deeply sincere deeply deeply sincere and, and i think that's very underrated the significance of that um, and when i say sincere meaning like there was a kind of devotion to being honest being being like really to, to earnest like we were really trying, really trying. We were really going for it. And you could tell, like people would just step into the space and they'd be like, what is this? And I think they were picking up on that sincerity, that that deep care. And when you create a culture, when you're in a culture of deep sincerity and care and honesty, um, that like something just starts to transform in the being. Cause I, from my perspective, like the, the kind of larger system, you know, is not oriented according to that sincerity. It's oriented towards like improvement and um, getting somewhere and getting things done and protecting like your vision, your, your, um, 
your sense of what should be done in the world or something like that. And Asori, you would often say like the world is the way it is because a lot of people are trying to fix it, you know? So like the world does not need to be fixed in my view, the world does not need to be fixed. It needs to be loved. And you learn that by being with other people in part, you learn that by being with other people and they just are the way they are. And then you see all the ways that you want to fix them. And you also see how fucked that is. Like people don't need to be fixed. They need to be loved. It's no different. And so, you know, over and over and over again in real community, if there's real intimacy and closeness, I mean, this is one of the challenges is like, you know, um, with like living near each other, you have to live near enough each other to trigger each other. Like there needs to be that enough, enough closeness and skin in the game for that actually to start happening for you to rub up against each other, get triggered your, the ways that you are uh, clinging gets touched and activated. And then the, the practice of meditation can actually function in terms of like cleaning you out so that you, you let go of all the things that stand in the way between you and actual connection and friendship, uh, which is generally the whole, all the ways that you think anybody else needs to change in order to be in relationship with you. Um, and so, you know, that, that was, I mean, that, yeah, you just basically like you, you try to do, <laughs> you know, you try to do things together really sincerely and then you fail and then, <laughs> you know, and then, and then you, you like have to look at the truth of that because you're sincere and, and, and you're stuck together, you know, you're trapped together, like, cause that's a real relationship and, 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 and then you have to just be with the, the truth of that and the pain of that. And it, it works you, it just does work you. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, and, and I think the, the ecology of practices in a certain way were, uh, were, were successful in so far as they like revealed truth and helped us like let go in relationship to it. Right. So circling, we did a lot of circling and I think that was really helpful because it like sort of like, um, clarified the the relational field and and uh, revealed a lot of what was like maybe hidden in the relationships which i think was you know it, it is actually very helpful um obviously we meditated a lot and that is a, a wonderful practice in most cases some people probably shouldn't meditate that's a whole conversation we should get into or could get into um and then we i introduced a lot of like emotional healing practices like the bioemotive framework and internal family systems. And eventually I, I did introduce uh, Alethea unfolding, which is what I practice mostly now. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I would critique Maple and I think more generally kind of Buddhist monasteries on is that they don't take seriously enough the psychological challenges of the kind of modern or postmodern human mind and that it really you need in order for to provide a robust context for transformation you need a pretty deep um psychodynamic and psychological method of uh unfolding and healing the human and that that should be integrated with the spiritual contemplative technologies and i think that maple was like headed in that direction but there was a lot like it was it was you know we were innovating so it was hard to really be clear about that and and to integrate that fully yeah, there's sometimes a tendency also to be like meditation will cure, or, you know, you sit sit with it and and so on. Press the meditation button and, and yeah. enough, and you'll yeah, be, you'll be would, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's very interesting. I and mean, I would say, you know, it really the integral to it, like the waking up and the grow uh, cleaning up, th this integration and this pollination, and we're, I think quite early. I mean, this it's been going on for it's certainly fifty, it's certainly since like the sixties when the West, mm -hmm. but in, in terms of that. Um, I also want to kind of maybe just bring out something I think I maybe heard, which is also, I think, you know, there's this kind of term now, ecology to practices and, you know, which basically means you've got some set of waking up, cleaning up, growing up practices that you're weaving together. And there's just one point here that I think you were getting at, which is that I, I think that's really interesting. You know, we talk about our life itself. We've talked about it at our, in our spaces a lot. And it's part of a general point that I have of our kind of techno fetishism of the West, mm -hmm. um, but transferred into a yet another area. I mean, and there's value to it, 
but I have this analogy of like playing the piano, you know, like and over like four or 500 years of people trying to be concert pianists or longer, you know, or trying to be get good at the piano or just learn the piano as a child. Mm-hmm. You no, know, we have made innovative innovations in technique and in training, but not, not a lot, right? Like it's like <laughs> a Suzuki method or something. And the fact is to get good at piano playing, you, you, you need to kind of practice quite a lot. You know, now it's true that a good coach, you know, you can practice yeah. badly and you can know and so on, but, mm-hmm. you know, and you might be very talented or you might not, but it's not like we've had some breakthrough technology where suddenly we go from like, you know, five years of training to like one week of training to be kind of mm-hmm. a concert pianist or something like that, or, you know, a decade or whatever. And I think what I'm going back to is you saying like, you do just need to rub up against people. You do. Yes. You, if you don't have the meditative practice, if you don't have the psychodynamic practice, it might just go very badly. Like everyone just falls out. But fundamentally, in this kind of growth and opening a heart and really learning to love ourselves and others and ex- really deeply kind of ex- in this dance to accepting them truly as they are, we're not no longer fixing. It doesn't mean lacking a commitment maybe to be of service, mm. but that that really just comes from a lot of practice and, you know, and, 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 time. and yeah. time, you know, and I say that because I think that sometimes again, we're like, oh, you know, we're going to optimize the practice or whatever. And it's just like in these areas, I think there's this, you know, I want to say different types of problems. There are problems that are really amenable to kind of technology type, you know, we're going to figure out an answer. And then once we've got the answer, everyone can just use it. And then there are other yes. kind of problems that are more like the concept pianist problem, which are like, yeah, you can make some improvements. It's good to think about, but fundamentally you have to practice and you have to practice together and so on. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, I would say I would say for me, like now, the way I look at it is actually the the problem of or the, the question of technique and method is yeah. much less interesting than the question of how do we actually get bodies together in spaces reliably and for and for and and have them stay there through the challenge. So they don't yes. just like leave. Um, you know, that's the that's really for me the the the, the, the interesting challenge. Yes, yes. And I even want to catch myself, like, not that there's a problem, but like, I use it as the analogy, because that's how we think about it. But it's like, just want to say, yeah, exactly. Like, the 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 interesting question, the interesting opportunity is that, and as you say, because that that sustained um, time together is what really makes a difference. Um, you know, I mean, we also, it's also a, just to go to one deeper thing about and I, I'm interested about it, how it showed up at Monastic Academy. So, you know, here at Life Itself, and Bergerac Hub, we've now run a mixture of things. We've run long, we've tried things like almost like a secular monastery for like quite a long period, like year, two years. We've run mm. things which are more like a month. And we always said we weren't really going to do a week thing. And we talked to people because people, we even had um, someone run, you know, we even ran like an experimental, deliberately developmental space program. And we were saying that if we run a week, because inside of that, there is a training for a week. People always leave like just so happy. They end of the week, they've trained them in, <laughs> in MVC and IFS and everyone leaves like, oh my God, it was incredible. You know, I got so yeah. much, so connecting. You put people together for a month <laughs> and around about at least certainly week three, there are breakdowns. There are people have conflicts basically, you know, that yes. God, you know, you're always bugging me with this or exactly. why do we have to have lunch at this time? Or, you know, um, you know, why do I have to come to heart sharing circle this week? I don't feel like it. Or, you know, you know, or, you know, or someone else like, Oh, why are we permitting people to not come to heart sharing circle? Because it's important, <laughs> whatever it is. And that though, I really think is the juice. I think That's you were it. saying that, 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 that the, the, the one week stuff is great and useful, but it's really the juice. And, and that's why we're always saying we're doing these at least a month because in our experience, yes. where it takes, you know, ultimately, I think that's not really long enough. Um, yes. but what I want, I'm interested in is my, my question, the challenge we then find is obviously people sometimes don't like it. You know, they, or they want to leave or they, or they do leave. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it also brings me to the other point, which is that there are some people who maybe it would be well for them actually would be well for them to maybe leave them like for whatever it's too triggering for them or it's just mm. they're gonna, it's gonna be uh unintentional it goes back to your point about occupy so how did monastic academy dance with that like how did what yes. what was the commitment because traditionally as a monk you, know, you make this big commitment you give away all your possessions you take massive vows um what enable people to sit with the trouble as it were the relational trouble to break to have these kind of breakthroughs and also mm-hmm. conversely how do you skillfully deal with people who like maybe even for them it's like you know i think the best metaphor i've had recently 
which came from my colleague Connor Carl, was you know a discussion we had was about like um, martial arts training. You know, like if a black, you know, if you're in a community which is maybe metaphorically like doing I don't know black belt, you know, like pretty intensive. You know, like people are going to say things that can resolve conflict, and you come along with a white belt. Either it, either white belt people get hurt, or the black belt people stop doing actual exactly. practice in a way. Yeah. So that question, just even being a skillful way for people, how do you have people kind of come who are in the right place, or people? So those two questions, yeah, like how do you have people stay and sit with the trouble? Um, yes. How did that work at Monastic Academy? What would it help people in a positive way to 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 stay? Yeah. I mean, this is, I don't think, a, th this question is not one that is a, one that's solved, but is one of those questions that you like, just try to create a relationship with, you know? Um, and that's, that's what it was like at Maple. Like I, I, I was one of the, one of the things I did there was, uh, I, I was in charge of admissions a lot. Not always, we, we rotated roles. That was part of the training was rotate, rotating leadership roles. Um, and I mean, we, ran lots of different experiments here. Um, when I first joined Maple, I just showed up through the doors for a year long commitment, you know, never having been there. I it just, I just showed up and I was there for a year, which, um, worked for me, but didn't work in a lot of cases. Um, you know, the way that we, uh, what we, end, what we, what we did, that we found that worked relatively well was people would come for a three month apprenticeship. And usually in the first couple weeks, sometimes in the first couple of days, you can kind of see like, Oh, is this like, is this going to, what's going on here? You know? And, and like you say, like every, almost anybody can, you can do anything for a week, but you get three weeks, month, two months. Like you start to see, do you get a deeper cut of like who they are, what they, what they're capable of, um, what they're ready for. Um, also, you know, even the conversations, like the admissions conversations, we would do interviews with people and um, you know, how much do you weigh like what they say about themselves versus the way they say it? Um, we, we would get very good at asking like, so like what's the most challenging experience you've been in, in your life? Like how, what was that like? And really looking at them, like really seeing like, can you feel them in their struggle when it gets really hard? Um, but it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's really, it's, it's challenging to assess if somebody's able to show up and into a space like, like Maple. Um, and, and we, you know, I think did the best we could. Um, now once people, uh, finish their three month apprenticeship, most people, vast majority of people are like, actually, I don't want to do this. This is um, gnarly and, and uncomfortable and just not good. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go now, which we were like, God bless you go. Um, <laughs> but for those few people who are like, you know what, I want to I wanna stay then, then if you know, there was a kind of conversation, we just sort of see if it was a good fit, but then you'd sign up for a year commitment. Um, you become a resident and, that, and, and you, you kind of at the end of that, you could re up for a year or more. And so we had a system of like, yeah, you commit for a period of time. Like I, I, I mostly did year commitments. And then at one point I did a three-year, like a three-year, either it was two or three-year commitment. And, and there's an understanding, you know, um, and this is, I think, something that's been kind of uh, undermined in our, in the larger culture of the value of commitments in terms of creating a kind of alchemical vessel for transformation that allows you to sit with the trouble, as you say, right? Because it's like, my integrity is on the line. I committed to this and it matters. Commitments are real. Yes. Right? Like it matters. And if you're talking about the Buddha making a commitment to not get up until he's enlightened, or if you're talking about, you know, I'm committed to being here for three months or a year, like we tried to create a culture where like commitments really, really, really matter. And that was really sore you. Like he was, he, I don't know how he got that, but probably from his training in Japan, like yes. commitments really matter. They are real. They are real. And we make them real by following through on them, you know, and that's how we build self-trust. That's how we build integrity. Um, that's how we become capable of doing what we say we're going to do. And that's, well, we do it, yeah. you know, um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and if you're in, if you're committed, if you're truly committed, then you just like, you don't have a choice. You're trapped. It's like a marriage, you know, you're trapped. Um, and, and then you find a way. You find a way uh, 
want to just riff on this because I think it's just so interesting point, which is that you're even using that word trapped in like a very positive way, which I think is really important because basically one of the things that we're in love with in modernity is, is freedom to freedom. I want to play my music the way I want to do when I want to do it. And I think we don't, I said this to someone the other day. I don't, the issue is it is a real van, you know, just to be clear. And there were cultures, you know, it's not a trivial thing because there were lots of, there are still cultures. There have been lots of parts of our history where, there was probably put a pressure, you know, I don't not only, it's not, only, I don't have freedom, but it's not like a positive kind of freedom, but mm. there's the kind of uh, commitment and a restriction, which for example, monasticism has where you mm. voluntarily made this commitment and you've given up all kinds of freedoms that grants a kind of power to us that we don't have any other way. And it shows up, as you say, we have to think about monasticism when I commit to get married. It was one of the yes. that my people are familiar with um, and which has been, it's always trivialized in the modern world. Um, but it's like, what? And I think this is something to to go, like, what is the power of that do you see? Because you're saying it in this, you know, normally we're trapped is a negative one, but you're saying that when we trap ourselves in this way, there's something available to us that isn't otherwise really available. Yeah, I mean, this is this is close to the heart of the transformation that I think is being called for right now, which is, the uh, i'm just going to say this in the way that i understand it we can talk about like why I, I say it this way but it's like the religious vision that we're indoctrinated into in our culture right now says that the path to happiness is through preference satisfaction satisfaction like satisfying our preferences and that yep. is just incorrect it's just not true the path to happiness is in letting go and being in in relationship and our preferences actually get in the way of that. And so, you know, that the, the traction that people feel when they have to get up at 4.40 a.m. every morning and they're like, oh, but I prefer not to. Like, it's exactly that that is the, the, the kind of smoothing out of the being that allows you to be in, in connection with life. Yes. Like, that's it. And, and, and but, but because of how confused our culture is, we think that that's the enemy that that's like exactly the wrong thing but that but that is that's the delusion that's the that's the confusion right there but we can't see it and that's why we need spaces in which we kind of submit ourselves where we we, we surrender to a larger thing that we trust you know and 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 that's part of the the beauty of teacherly authority um and and it's something that people, many people in our culture are deeply, deeply afraid of, and in part for good reason, because a yeah. lot of, you know, people in positions of authority are not trustworthy. And so we, we, you know, all the time at Maple, people were super triggered, like, oh, you know, they, they, even when they sign up, they know what they're getting into. And then there's a schedule that they can't, they can't not do. And they're like, they get all tight. And they're like, I, I you know, I, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, because it's not, it's not like a cognitive thing. It's like a, it's there. It's in there. It's in their body, um, and that's that's what we work through. That's what we slowly like let go. We're like, oh, so good to let go. It's so good. It's so good not to have to choose. It's so oppressive to have to choose all the time. You know, to have to to have to be enslaved to your preferences. People don't realize yes. how burdensome that actually is. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, this, if I could take one, you know, one of the places I started to feel, I mean, I was, I, I went into economics mainly because I saw it as like a plumbing, you know, like if you want to build houses for, you know, then you need to know plumbing. You might not think plumbing mm. super exciting, but I, I was obviously a Buddhist or, or very, I, I was practicing already at this point. And I did this whole thing on Buddhist economics because, you know, like, you know, the whole of, you know, economics, which is the totemic discipline is like, you know, how do we, we've got this unlimited wants and all this is about is how we can satisfy our, our preferences versus yeah. obviously Buddhism of like kind of in a way transforming preferences, which isn't even considered in that thing. And it's so, it is deep. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose my question is, could you share a little bit you talked about i mean it comes across just in your sharing but for people maybe listening who this would be like they can touch it but like would what would but maybe to really inspire them what do you saw like you got 
like you've talked about this, the the unfolding, you've talked about, you know, being, mm-hmm. being in a relationship, it, it comes across in your speaking, but to kind of, what did you get out of making that kind of commitment? Do you see, if you were saying to someone else, like, like they're kind of, it's this someone who should, you know, what kind of wants to do it, but like, what is it that has a, would pull people forward into, because it's kind of like, it's it's scary to us because there is all this trauma, cultural trauma, I'd even say of like how we were oppressed, how, how the Inquisition yes. What happened last time we gave away our power or authority, you know, what did you, you know, what did you see for yourself out of that experience of being a kind of in a way like a a lay monastic for a period of time? So I'll, I'll use a frame that I've, I've taken from one of my mentors, Zach Stein, which is uh, I, I now look at the whole path as the path of the clarification of desire. That's what that's what I'm up to. I think that's what we're up to. We're clarifying our desire, which means like really becoming intimate with the complex motivations and motivational structuring of the psyche and the mind and the heart. And you know, when we talk about preferences in our culture, often we kind of take them as a given, like, oh, I want a Tesla, right? Well, do you? What do you really want? And, and how, how do we inquire into our preferences? And this is what we do in like in my, you know, kind of coaching unfolding practice. It's like, well, a part of me wants a Tesla, but is that is that desire rooted in a deeper sense of emptiness and deficiency? Can we become intimate with that deeper sense of deficiency and emptiness? What happens when we become really intimate with that? Like, what's the truth of our desire? What's the truth of our longing? And and can we kind of uh, unfold it and you know this is and and see like our deepest soul and heart desire and it's not for the satisfaction of our preferences it's it's more like to live a good life to be to to live to love well like that's what we actually I believe deeply want but there's so much like bullshit like narrative and 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 like falsified desires and preferences. I mean, like if you look at a documentary, like the century of the self, I think it's called like all the money that is poured into confusing us about what we want. Yes. So much is it, we're so confused. We don't know what we really want. And, and when we're confused in that way, we're vulnerable. We are vulnerable to Moloch. We're vulnerable to forces that want to manipulate us to, to, to have us act in service of desires that aren't actually ours, that we don't truly believe in. And when we act on behalf of desires that aren't truly ours and that we don't believe in, we feel unsatisfied, we suffer. And and we look at our life and we feel like it's hollow and we aren't, we aren't being true somehow in a way that we can't even really articulate. And so, you know, what I received was just like, I felt like I stopped kind of automatically acting on behalf of what I thought I wanted long enough to start to sense what I actually wanted. Um, and, 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 and I started to see like, Oh, if I live according to that, it's just much better according to my own sensing, not according to like the stories that our world offers about what a good life is, but actually according to my own assessment, like I'm more proud of myself. I'm more like, I feel more connected. I feel like there's more meaning in life. And so, it, it, yeah, it's it's really this process of 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 clarifying uh, the interiority, like what what's really going on, like what <laughs> you know when I when, when there's a movement of of reaching and wanting, like what what's that like rooted in? You know, what's the deeper structuring that that gives rise to that? Because we're not simple. Like the mind is a complex yeah. system, you know. So it actually takes time to really look at it and clarify it. Exactly. Like I would say that the uh, it's what you're describing is one key aspect of wisdom, personally, and then I'd even say collectively, which is knowing what we really want. Yes, exactly. Like real wants versus non-real wants, or in uh, you know, right. If we leave you Buddhist language, like right wanting versus un- not right wanting. Yes. Uh, and yeah, again. It's 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 a sacred cow of modernity. I mean, just we're gonna this might bring it, but then you know that hey, you know, I know what I want. I you yeah. know, 
it's not, you know, why yeah, is that exactly. needed? Um, exactly. So I think this is really, a, really a classic point. And I think a very interesting question. You know, I think it's one of the ones that I like to ask. I like asking, you know, I like asking maybe more friends and family. And, and um, yeah, we're going a little, I don't, I don't, there's, a, there's stuff, quite a bit of work we did at Once Life for Self because we saw this, but we called them blind spots, mm. partly in actually out of landmark, but you know, so blind spots for yourself personally are things that we get reactive to or that we don't see, but which are influencing how we act, you know, which is mm. a lot of, um, so you could say, you know, you've got a yes. bias car, which is where you have accidents, but collective ones, as you say, are, for example, this view that we know what we want. Um, and mm -hmm. it relate, why I would say it relates, to, there's also this aspect of trauma often is, you know, obviously, you know, when I brought this up, just, I don't know what happens when you bring up these views, but if you bring it up with, in my experience, the people who are maybe not coming, let's say from a Buddhist background, like, but, you know, well, look at the Nazis or look at the Inquisition or look at, you know, there's, there's this mm -hmm. immediate like, well, when, when we gave, you know, when, why should someone else tell us what to do? You know, or there's right. false consciousness in exactly. Marxism. And I think there's very understandable reactivity and maybe it will take us off is to, I guess is the question, and this maybe starts to bring us to the last part of this, we might not have all the time to explore today, but it's what, what, what are wise actions, wise paths, is um, how do you, you know, are, are, how does one heal those reactivities in ourselves and maybe collectively? Hmm. You know, because to do what I'm trying to say in the positive sense is what we're really agreeing. But the reason people got into very like, I know what I want, because for many long time people were not allowed to want what they wanted, you yes. know, what they were told. And so there's this huge cult reaction when you start saying, hey, maybe you don't know what you want. Um, you know, maybe take the one example I have also is there's a there's a great talk by Thich Nhat Hanh about he's gone to Google, he's giving talks at Google and they're like, he's like, well, you, we're kind of creating these distraction machines rather than, you know, you know, mm -hmm. well attention machines. And they're like, and like the engineer is like, great. Okay. You know what we'll do? We'll create an option to like not have, you can turn on notifications or not notifications. And Tina yes. like, no, 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 you should default it to off. You know, of course you can allow them. <laughs> yes. And then she's like, how dare you do that? You know, like, but you're interfering with their choice. And like Tina right. is like, what do you mean choice? And obviously there's this kind of disjunction mm -hmm. between a well-meaning engineer. And, and I guess what I'm asking at this point is from hmm. coming more to like the work you did with your, your own personal research and the Emerge podcast, this kind of these kind of questions of how do you shift, you know, you know, you and I sitting here going, yeah, yeah, but like, how do you share these kind of ideas and in a well way, you know, not saying, oh no, you know, choice is bad. Well, no, we're not saying that. We're saying something quite deep, which is there's different kinds of choice, and one can feel, one can learn through certain practice, through in being in in relationship with others normally in sangha and others ways to practice sensing for example what is kind of weller or writer choice and less right choice more genuinely yes. most authentic uh true choice versus those yes. that have been given to me somehow in whatever way by advertising by culture by my even my sometimes my innate programming that you might i don't like that term but my you know that but it isn't really true when i look deep into my my heart it's really me or what yes. i'm really yeah, I mean, this is the this is in a sense the 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 question. Um, I, I don't I don't know that I have a good answer, but it's certainly something that I'm very keen to, you know, engage with. I, I, I think, in part, we have to kind of, I think it's it's right to take a step back, right? And this is where for me the question of like religious vision, religious view. Mm -hmm. comes in right because what we're touching on are a lot of as you say sacred cows sort of like axioms of the dominant religious tradition in the world right now which is secular humanism materialism and there are certain again and that might even trigger people right that might trigger people and so what do you do with triggering like do, does that mean that you're like oh you're wrong right is that the vision of what triggering means is that somebody has done something wrong or is that actually a call to look inside right? Like what's being touched in me, in my depths? What am I, what am I afraid of? Right? So if, when I say that secular humanism, materialism is a religion, is a religious view, like, you know, that's how I see it. 
Is that, you know, and so, and, and it's like, um, that religious vision doesn't support the conditions for this kind of interior clarification. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not good at that. You actually, for most people, when they come to Maple, we have to go through this whole process of deconstructing and kind of freeing the mind from all of these assumptions about the way the world works and about what the human is. And we have to like, in many cases, we have to, you know, this is, this is the very first kind of precondition of Buddhism is like right view. We call, it's called right view in Buddhism, meaning that there is such a thing as goodness. There is such a thing as truth. There's, there's possible to live a good life. It's possible to live a bad life. I want to live a good life. You know, like these, these things, it's like, there is such a thing as value as truth. Yes. You know, there is such a thing. There is such a thing. And if you have a religious vision or a metaphysics or an implicit vision of what the world is, where that is not the case, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time yes. orienting to the world and clarifying your own sensitivity to the presence or absence of truth, what is trustworthy, what is good. You're going to be very susceptible to forces that want to use you on behalf of things that are not good and true and beautiful. And so there's, I think this kind of conversation that, you know, that we're having right now. And so there's a kind of like propositional clarification that is happening, you know, with Ian McGilchrist's book and many other thinkers who are like, oh, like actually, no, there, there, there is actually though, actually, actually something called truth. Yes. Actually, actually, we, oops, we were a little bit confused there. We actually did have to do some deconstruction. Like people use the term truth in a way that was fucked up. Like we should, we should call that out. But like, still though, there is something that is, is, is true. And, and like truth is important and we should actually like live our lives in integrity with it. And we should build culture that's in integrity with it. Like we need to clarify that propositionally and kind of create, and then we can create spaces where people are like earnestly and sincerely endeavoring to get right with that. Um, but until you've clarified that, like, and, and sort of like, at least like made explicit the sort of religious indoctrination that is currently dominating most people's worlds, uh, I think you, you don't have enough space to kind of maneuver. And it, yeah, there's too much reactivity. There's too much trigger. Uh, there's too much like defensiveness. And then it's really hard. It's really hard to create these spaces where people actually stay long enough to transform. Um, and, and what you have is a kind of, I think mostly superficial, mostly, um, kind of rearranging of propositions and, and ideas sort of approach to transformation, which is important. We need to get propositionally clear, but that deeper work doesn't, I don't think happen until you get yes. in real traction until you really do, you really are trapped, um, in a way where, you know, you're, you're forced to clarify, you're kind of, you're, you're it's, nece it's necessary. Um, and so it's like, how do you, yeah, how do you craft, uh, a, 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 an understanding of, of what I am, what a human is and what I ought to do that allows me to enter into these, um, prolonged experiences of vulnerability, uh, and not kind of freak out and, and, um, give up and, be like, no, actually, I'm just going to get it, you know, whatever. Get a um, job. Yeah, in, job. In, in, in excavation thing, yeah. Or, or, and I think to, so just to recap one really important point there that's itself is that there is truth or, you know, I like to say, you know, even it's not like there is the truth, like we're saying, no. oh, I, but there is up and down. We may not have know where the top of the mountain is. It's shrouded. You know, maybe there are even several tops of the mountain, but we do know what up is. But we're currently in a lot of our situation not knowing what up is. And we don't mean like not knowing what up is and like what temperature is it today. It's mm -hmm. in the much more profound area of like what can what what is actually well wants or right wants mm -hmm. or the wrong mm -hmm. ones. And I, you know, I joke when people say like, you know, because I, I know let's put people who are quite relativist in this sense, but who are let's say into Buddhism. You know, I, mm -hmm. I next to Plum Village. So I meet a fair number of these people. And I said, you know, but you do realize the Buddha didn't call them the four noble opinions. Uh, I mean, <laughs> even aside the translation from the Pali, right? Yeah, um, right. You know, or, or he didn't say it was like, you know, my, my, you know, you know, my opinion on view. It's like right view and wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, exactly. it's like, and, and I think that's one axis, but I think this is a really profound point. The one I use, by the way, is I think you mentioned Ian McGilchrist as trying to set this out and this, 
I'll come back to the dance group, but there's Emma Gilchrist and the other one who people don't refer to as much, but I, I really, is Christopher Alexander mm. who does the pet language because totally. I actually think about before, you know, he writes the Times Square Building and I think it's such a great area. I mean, I, I actually have personal experience right now because we've been trying to build stuff and talk to architects. I mean, you cannot find an architect who believes that there is a better or worse way to build now, in my experience. Mm. Always, I mean, they might be like, oh, it's more ecological, but everyone's like, no, but whatever you, I mean, mm. I literally have talked to now dozens, they're all like, no, no, it's just whatever you want. You know, there isn't a more living or a more dead building, yeah. you know, and, and so on. And I find that as a great area because it, it, it's very concrete, you know, you can point to buildings. And Alexander really, I mean, he died now uh, two years ago, I think is one of the great, thinkers like a lot funny enough along with McGilchrist if you like people mm. setting out this in a compelling way and I think to to emphasize maybe to listen to the subtlety of this is that, that it's not like we're talking about truth in a obviously it can't be quite the same as like we measured it with a thermometer so it's got to be a different kind but it's one that you know and this is this dance right it's and people are like but hey but then it's just subjective and you're like well no it's not quite subjective. No. Yeah. <laughs> what is what is this and that that will take us a bit further afield but i think that's one really big um i mean when we, if we're going to be we, let's call it a religion you know just we say there is a religion i think of modernity or of, as you say secular humanism part of the the religion of tomorrow is this kind of faith um mm -hmm. grounded and it's a, it's just like all good religion grounded in something you know that we can touch and share in some way um, they're not like proof in a, you know, mathematical, here's my proof sense. One of that is that there is this truth, as you say, of like writer wanting, writer, even the good, the true and the beautiful are okay. real, yes. not just uh, true as in a scientific reductionist sense. Mm -hmm. I think on that note, I don't want to leave you with any last, you know, for this session, I don't know it's been, we didn't even fully get to our, our last point of like, really get to fully explore like where where things are going and what you what you saw out of your quest maybe with your podcast and you're talking with people i want to leave that maybe for today but i'd like to leave you with a moment maybe any final reflections uh that you'd like to to leave with today from from the dialogue yeah yeah i think i think this question of of like what is truth is so key and um I'm still learning how to speak about it into our into our culture, like to speak speak into it, right? Because it's 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 hard and and it's true. I, I don't mean to suggest that there's like one fixed truth. Actually, that's very much not the case. Like if if you know anything about Buddhism and emptiness, that's exactly not the way it is. Um, this this truth that you and I are are that you and I love, I would say, because I think love is actually a very important part of it, um, is not propositional, right? To use John Verveke's terms, it's not to be found in propositions. It can be kind of reflected there, but it's not, yeah. it doesn't live there. And for me, it's more about like a taste or a smell or a feeling than it is about a proposition. And it's not like it's, fixed it's actually alive it's yes. alive it moves us because we love it it moves us and it has more to do with like the thing that i'm afraid to say to my lover than it has to do with something in a philosophy book right it has more to do with the the the, the, the life the unlived life that keeps me up at night when i'm a, a financier Right. And I'm doing a job that I actually really hate, even though I show up and pretend I don't. Right. You actually do hate it. That's the truth. Right. And so it's like, how do we give life? How do we liberate the truth, that truth? Right. That's more the kind of quality and, and sense of truth that I'm I'm speaking to. And that's why you say, like, to live, what does it mean to live a true life? Right. A true life. Um, it's not, you don't get there by reading books or by listening to podcasts. You get there by making choices that are in, in integrity with that, the, like the the clearest sense of it that you have, um, and and then and then and then you fail, and then you clarify, and then you keep you know it's, it's alive, it, it's alive, it lives in life, um, it's not somewhere else, uh, but it's really important. I think it's really important to talk about this kind of thing and to really like, um, yeah, to 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 try to escape the sort of like easy. Um, 
you know, kind of stereotypes or appropriately reactive, like rejections of certain visions of what truth is, because we do, I, th- I believe we need, we need truth. Like, you know, there's this question, um, again, that, that, that Zach Stein would, would kind of pose where he's like, you know, um, when convention breaks down and, and, you know, convention is the thing that 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 has or or often does coordinate humans, right? Convention. Yes, it's a. And it's like a, okay, so now now it's like we're 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 kind of like seeing through convention, and there are those of us who are beginning to become or who are kind of operating in a kind of post-conventional way, where we're kind of beyond convention. We've seen through convention. Something else is moving us. It's like well, how do we how do we coordinate? people beyond convention. Yes. But my my deep sense is that it's actually through the clarification of devotion to truth, right? So that we can start to kind of like feel it together and be moved in the world by it. And that that is, you know, that that demands truth. We have to have that. We have to like yes. acknowledge it. It has to be like we have to be like this is real and valuable, and I am in service to it beyond my preferences, beyond my myself. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and I mean it talks the. Well, I, I want to give you the last word. I think that yeah. So I. <laughs> it talks the whole challenge people have, like, oh, we want an alternative value system, or you, you want something beyond the reductionist science, a way of coordinating agreement about choices in things, and therefore valuing things. This is the access. So maybe that that's a teaser for our next, uh, if next session, if we have one. I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Daniel. It's been mm. absolutely uh, a joy, and mm. uh, yeah. Look forward to uh, look forward to our next our next session if we when we when we arrange it. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Rufus. It's a pleasure.